I think I was kind of the, the middle, I was the middle child in the family, so I was always the peacemaker. And I, I think that's been with me from the get-go. You know, I always tried to resolve things the best I could. Now, sometimes my brother and I, the only way it could be resolved was rolling around in the backyard throwing punches. But uh, we did, you know, we always did get it resolved. And that was something that, you know, I've been doing since I was a little kid. You, you've been in a lot of contentious situations, not only as a, as a pastor, but as a in police chaplaincy. Is there something that other people just, that, uh, that you have, that you know that will uh, basically always work in those situations where you have a, a room full of people that are angry with each other, or? I don't know if it's just one thing, um, there are so many things that it really depends on the situation. Um, I was a hostage negotiator for a number of years, and a lot of times people just needed somebody to listen to them. They needed somebody to hear their side of the story, and because it was it was alcohol involved and divorce involved and and all kinds of different things, and somebody just needed to listen to them. And if you could take that time without them feeling rushed or that you're trying to move them along and listen to their side of things, it could take the, the anger out of the moment. The same is true in the church. If you'll just take the time to listen to that angry person or that group of angry people's story, usually it's not as bad as they think it is. And once they talk it out, it's, they realize it too that it's not really not that bad. And that's something that can be fixed and it can be, you know, it can be dealt with with family counseling, with a person that's barricaded themselves in the house. It can be worked out with, you know, therapy with AA, with, you know, sitting down with their kids and getting things worked out with them. Uh, but you just gotta listen. When was the first time that you you did something that where you had the experience of that, that I'm that was a chaplain thing I just did there. I mean that was a that was a I'm I, I'm a chaplain now. I, I, I do you know it was pure one hundred percent chaplain. Do you remember? I I believe it was a a drowning of a of about a three year old child uh, in the neighbor's pool. And uh, I was called out, went out there, and I truly felt like I was able to help that family um, get through this because it was, I can't think of anything worse. I had little kids at the time myself, and, and I couldn't think of anything worse than that. And just to be able to sit with them and get them through all the difficult decisions that had to be made and get them through their anger with the neighbor and with themselves and with, uh, you know, just all the circumstances that were involved in this. That, that's probably the first time I really felt like I was doing the right thing and I was in the right spot. Did, did, did all of this come, did, it, did this come naturally to you, I guess? Did, did, um what was the what was the part of chaplaincy that just absolutely had to be is not intuitive that had to be taught to you uh, that you learned from in, in, uh, from training? Uh, just some of the detail things, um, uh, obviously some of the legal things that are attached to being a chaplain and making sure that you have you know used to be the only thing that a chaplain could get sued for was making a false death notification. So I made absolutely 100% certain that I was going to the right house, had the right family, had the right person. Um, and, you know, those things were taught to me through other chaplains that, and, and through people who understood what the chaplaincy was about and they were very helpful. It was mostly the detail stuff. The, the the people stuff, part of it is, was just God-given stuff, and the other stuff I learned at the seminary and and through being a pastor. Um, but the legal stuff was 
it was necessary. It's always necessary. Real briefly, I, I had never heard that before. That there was the that there was a concern that you were about to notify the wrong you know the wrong person, and, and that you have to make sure that the you're going up to the right house and all this kind of stuff. You can obviously traumatize someone. Well, I mean, I mean, kind of unpack that a little bit. When you you uh, you want to make one hundred percent sure. When I would be called to a scene of a motor vehicle motor vehicle accident, I would look at the driver's license. I would go back to the coroner's office and look at the person in the light because most of these things happen late at night and and to make sure that the picture on the driver's license matched the person if that was possible. I would look for other identification. I would look at their phone to see if their name was the name registered into the phone. Um, and then I would make sure the address was correct. And it's amazing to me how many people don't carry any forms of identification on them. And it's, that's the worst possible thing that you can do. Because then we got nothing. We don't have any place to go. And your mom or your dad or your wife or husband or children are sitting out there wondering what happened to you. And we can't tell them because we don't know who you are. And you know, some of them would take days before we could make a proper notification. A lot of times I would use other chaplains. Um, we had a lot of foreign drivers, uh, truck drivers that were killed. And I would be calling Australia probably three times a year, talking to a chaplain in, somewhere in Australia to make the notification uh, for me for a truck driver that was killed. Um, you know, so it's been nice to have that, you know, and they did their due diligence as well to make sure that we were talking about the same person. Uh, you know, that was the great part of the, the whole network of chaplains that, that exists already.